Well, folks, I'm Mike Eastman. Welcome to Eastman's podcast. Today, I have a special guest. Um, he is one of my right-hand men. Uh, I know it seems like uh, we're doing the, the Eastman's crew, which is kind of fun because I'm sharing with you a little bit of behind the curtain, what goes on at Eastman's and who is behind the curtain, who the man behind the curtain is. Um, today, I've, I've got Scott Reekers with me, and uh, Scott's been uh, 10 years, almost 10 years <laughs> almost with 10 us, years. and um, he... He came to us as a, a young kid that was in ministry. <laughs> kid, <laughs> I was I turned thirty that year, so I guess I was a kid to you. Uh, he was. He's, he's, you're always gonna be a kid. Now That's I know true. how my parents felt. So, so Scott came to us uh, from ministry. Uh, he is a Wyoming boy. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, and lots of cool things we've done in the last mm-hmm. ten years. So let's. Scott, let's talk about uh, who you are. You weren't actually born in Wyoming. I just want to make, you know, that's no, a big thing. I was thing. actually born. I was born under Rock Springs. Oh, I didn't know that. I thought you were born in Iowa. No. Oh. Well, that that well, story is actually shoot. really cool. Now I, ha- dang it, now I have to rearrange all of my questions to not <laughs> jab you about not living in Wyoming your whole life. Okay. I- I was born in Rock Springs in 83. I mean, now you can make jokes about Rock Springs. We've done that before. I mean, on our Black Rifle podcast, that was like half the conversation was that town. So, Well, if you've ever been to Rock Springs, Wyoming, you'll understand. Yeah, I won't I won't go down that road. Lots of great people there, but for some reason, they put every trailer park next to the interstate. I don't know why. Uh, it was a convenience. <laughs> and it was, it, you know, Rock Springs was a boom and bust town. Mm-hmm. It always has been all the way back to, you know, when they yep. bring the railroad across. That yep. was the intent. And so, you know, mining has been a huge part of that yep. and, and energy development has been a huge part. And that's kind yep. of what happens. Yeah. Um, it, it, we tease Rock Springs a lot, but there's actually a lot of good things that have come out of that, yep. of, out of that town. You know, we had the mafia in there in, in mm-hmm. the eighties, which was fun. I mean, <laughs> who can say that, that the mafia still existed in the eighties? Well, and here's the funny part. My dad was hired by the police chief who came after the whole there was an incident where an officer shot a prisoner, uh-huh. right? Mm-hmm. And so that all happened on 60 Minutes. And so when my dad and mom moved out there, they really didn't know what they were getting into. Then dad move, moves there, and he, he has all these people like, we saw it on 60 Minutes. You're moving to Rock Springs. You really want to go work for that police department? You know, It was really corrupt yeah. back then. It was bad. And so my dad started working for the police chief that cleaned a bunch of that stuff up. Uh-huh. He was the guy after all of that. Um, And so here's a funny story. My mom and dad had been married for seven years. They couldn't have kids, couldn't figure it out, couldn't figure it out, been to multiple doctors. They were already going down the road on adoption, all those different things. And they looked at life and dad was like, you know, I always said I wanted to live in the Rocky Mountain West. They had, they actually took their honeymoon in Colorado at Estes Park. So for them, the mountains were a place they wanted. Because they are from Iowa. Yeah, they're from Iowa. All my extended family's from Iowa. And so what happened was dad saw this ad in a policeman's journal. He's like, why not? So he sent his resume and they're like, hey, you, we, we don't have to send you to the shorter academy. We need officers now. And so they brought him So out. he was a cop in Iowa? Yeah, he was a cop in oh, Iowa. Oh, okay. And he was in a department that had three officers and one chief. And the chief was a new, like a newly put in that position. There was no space for advancement. And then he also saw the pay scale in Rock Springs versus what he was getting in Iowa. And he's like, it's kind of a no-brainer. Even if we only go out there for five years, right. I have the experience. I've been in a bigger department. I can get hired into, into leadership faster. And, and Rock Springs was booming. Rock that Springs was right was in the booming. middle of, of one of those you know, yep. economic energy booms. <laughs> and so dad goes in for his interview. Mom goes to the school district. And she's hired before my dad is as a teacher. And so she she ends up calling the police department where he's doing the interview to let him, let him know that, hey, I'm ready for a ride. And, oh, by the way, I got a job, so I guess we're doing this. <laughs> and he um, he says basically the The interviewers thing. are looking at these two people going, you're moving here? <laughs> yep. In the middle of this? <laughs> yep. Okay. So mom got hired, and then dad got hired, and then... One of the things for them that was always like a godsend where they're like, okay, we know we're supposed to be in Wyoming. The first doctor they went to, just because new doctors, may as well try. We'll see what yep. they say. Go to the first new doctor, and the first new doctor's like, they didn't see this in Iowa? One simple outpatient procedure, my mom was pregnant the next month with me. Wow. I guess that is a, uh, yeah, you're supposed to be here mm-hmm. type moment. And so they decided that God wanted them in Rock Springs. 
And so they were like, you'll hear this theme throughout, you know, throughout who is Scott Reeker's segment is that ministry and church life has been a huge piece of who I am, what I do, why I do the things I do, the way I conduct myself in the way I do the things I do. And so they helped, um, the church I grew up in, they helped build. Um, they were the like the Emmanuel Baptist Church. So I actually worked at that church for four and a half years. Um, they helped build that. They were a part of all the starting with that. They were young young people when they did that. Um, but they looked at Rock Springs as God brought us here, and so we're going to stay here and we're going to invest um, in this in this town and in this community. And they did that, you know. And so I was thrilled to be a part of that. Um, funny part was though, it did moving from Iowa to Wyoming, there was a culture shock adjustment, <laughs> I'll bet. but they figured it out. And one of the things that they always did, um, is they figured out that in rock Springs, there are constantly people moving in and out. So like holiday season, that what we just went through is we, we had a terrible trip back to Iowa for Christmas. Um, sounds familiar, like what I just went through. Um, <laughs> and so this is back in the days of carburetors, and Dad was outside heating up a carburetor in a Suburban to keep the engine running because they couldn't get it warm enough while they're driving. This is by Cheyenne, of oh, all yeah. places. And so they couldn't keep it warm enough. Finally got it warm enough where the carb would actually stay, where it wouldn't freeze up and condensation yep. issues and things like that. Cardboard and, in the front of the mm-hmm. in, in the front of the grill. Yep. Drove all the way like that to Iowa. And then they then dad had the new grill with the cover on it by the time we drove back. He yep. was not doing that again. But then they decided that, you know what, we're gonna do holidays at home with our family. Then in the afternoons, we know there's a ton of people that don't have family through church. And they'd always invite them over. So I never knew knew who was going to be coming over for Christmas dinner. Um, But it was always who we made our family in those places. Oh, that's pretty cool. So so, you're not you're not an only child. No, at least you don't act that way. No, I don't. (laughs) I got two sisters. Um, And so I got I have two sisters. And then um, I had some very good um, guy friends uh, all through junior high and in high school. And they, um, my lifelong friends, lifelong friends. Yeah. Um, I've heard you talk about them. Oh yeah. And Travis, um, Travis actually came up here. He had a white tail tag up here. And so he, and uh, he and his wife and daughter came and they had dinner with us. They're actually expecting another baby. And so I'm excited for them to see, to see that. And so, um, I, I can, I actually on a hunt ran into him on the way out of, out of town, him and his dad, Mm -hmm. him and his dad. And so that's been a lifelong friendship there. Um, but you know, lifelong friendships are, are something that I want. Lifelong relationships are what I want. I've been thinking about a few years back, I sat down and wrote, what is my mission statement? Cause like, this is going to sound crazy. I work for a hunting company and we're on a hunting podcast, but at the end of my life, the animals that I killed will be a very small segment of my eulogy. They'll talk about that. It'll be the stories told from the hunt and the relationships that I had with people. So my goal at the end of my life is that there will be a string of people, whether it be through ministry, through work, um, through my family relationships, that I have discipled people, and there's a string where they're doing the same. That's cool. That's my lifelong goal. It's kind of it's kind of like uh, we kind of jumped ahead on on the list of things I wanted mm-hmm. to talk about, but you're it's kind of like paying paying it forward mm-hmm. in the sense of of your ministry and paying it forward. And yep. and we'll get a little bit further into that. I, co- I have okay. a couple questions about okay. that. So, but back to childhood. So, mm-hmm. siblings, um, how long have you hunted? Did your dad did he hunt in <laughs> Iowa? <laughs> he hunted pheasants in Iowa. So what was the, so what was the draw to? to I'm not going to say Rock uh, Rock Springs, but what was the draw to the Rocky Mountain West? So, dad loved mountains. He loved fishing. He loves he loves exploring. And so, naturally. Um, the idea of hunting once it was available to him because in Iowa at the time when he was growing up in Iowa, their corn harvest wasn't as high. So the deer population wasn't as high and then access to hunting that wasn't also there. And in the fall, when you're in height, like during his years where he could be learning how to hunt, he was playing football, Uh, you know, so that's what you do. So pheasant hunting was after that, but pheasant was King back then too. Right. It still might be to some degree, like kind of it is in Dakotas. But, um, so now, with what he did is he moves to this area in the Rocky Mountain West. And again, in church, he meets this old guy named JR, who's an old oil field guy. And so JR would draw these cow tags. JR Ewing? No, JR Harris. <laughs> 
Sorry, that's before your time. <laughs> There's a TV show called Dallas. The character's <laughs> name was J.R. Ewing, and he was an oil guy. Well, uh, probably some similarities. And I just so, showed my age. I should tuck that back in. <laughs> so, yeah. So uh, J.R. called Dad and was like, hey, I'm picking you up at 7, which happened to be when Dad would get off night shifts. Picked him up at 7 a.m., let Dad sleep for two hours on their way to the oil field, and he knew where the elk were in the oil field, but he needed somebody to help him load the elk up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you could kill an elk, but you're going to help me load yes. them. <laughs> so Dad Dad got the elk bug, but he had no idea what he was doing. Like, he had no idea. So my neighbor, um, the Olsons, who's actually Casey Olson, is, a, is a still a friend of mine. I played hockey with him growing up. He's trying to talk me into going out to Minnesota and shoot a whitetail with him, and I'm trying to talk him back here to shoot a mule deer, that sort of thing. So um, Bob said to my dad, you, you don't know what you're doing. And so that was the first time that somebody brought us into Region G. Bob And took, and took him under his wing and mm-hmm. showed him, yep. don't step there, don't yep. do that. Yep. Do this. Yep. And so take that shot. Uh huh. And so Bob, um, Bob ta- took him and they went hunting a few times together. And Bob was gracious enough and said, Steve, I don't care if you keep coming to these places. Um, you're more than welcome. Cause Bob was a shift worker. And so Bob actually ended up being my hockey coach for years too. It was kind of, kind of a crazy, you know, crazy how, how small world, small town Wyoming is. And so dad got started elk hunting and believe it or not, he didn't kill anything till he drew a tag south of Rock Springs. Then, and so time, time this, I was born in 83, okay? Eastman started in 1987, and then we know when, you know, when it started, like, by the time I'm in high school, the Eastman's journals are showing up at the grocery store that I'm working at. And me and these lifelong friends, we all worked at Smith's. So we would fight each other when the new copies of Eastman showed up finally to the point where our boss would either buy the magazine and set it out for us so that we wouldn't destroy the copies because we were too cheap to buy them ourselves, right. you know? Right. And so he'd buy it and set it down like, don't wreck the ones on the newsstand. <laughs> you can't do that. It's a ruin in all 12 <clears throat> copies. Just yes. ruin one. <laughs> exactly. And so Why that is was this page a, sticky. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, there, there was, <laughs> you went there. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. So shouldn't drink this early in the morning. <laughs> mine's coffee, just for the record. <laughs> Mine is too. <laughs> and <laughs> not surprised. Um, so moving, like we would, we all started reading that, and then I went to school in Texas, and I graduated in 2002. So you can EBJ and EHA is ramping up about the same time. Mike's book came out in '97. Finally got a hold of it while I was in college. My buddy Travis, yep. he bought it at a show um, and came back and he let me read it over one of the breaks. And so I he was one of the hundreds of thousands yes. of guys that read that book. <laughs> yes. It's pretty incredible how many people have read that book. Um, and so he, I read that book, took a bunch of notes and I realized I'm doing this completely wrong. I, there, there's, there's an easier way. There's an easier way. You don't, you don't walk 50 miles. You don't um, just go ride your four wheeler all over. The, the elk aren't there. The deer aren't there in those spots. And so, um, back then, I hadn't quite caught the mule deer bug yet. I just caught the hunting bug. I just wanted to be in the field, like trying to figure out what was going on. And elk always seem to be the harder ones for some reason. Like I think getting your first elk is hard. I think getting your first mule deer is probably easier because yeah. there's a little four corner around a bunch of corners, you know? Well, and it's, it, it's not just, you know, taking the, the animal, but once you have an elk on the ground, mm-hmm. life becomes really, really hard versus a deer. I mean, mm-hmm. a deer, two guys can pack out with their stuff. You can yep. walk out with that. Yep. You are not doing that with an elk. No, they're, they're, they're four times the size. Four times the size. <laughs> it's the equivalent of of shooting a, a big dog versus a horse. I mean that's mm-hmm. that's the difference. Yep. And it's and so by the time I left high school, our group, not myself, had had a we'd put a few elk on the ground. We'd figured out how to do that. And then that education continued. So Coming back from college, I went to college in Texas for four years. I said, I said after high school that, or starting sometime in high school, I was like, you know what? Wyoming's always going to be here. I want to go see something different. Yeah. I, I want a little bit different experience. That's and funny. I had the complete opposite. I went to college and went, 
I am not leaving Wyoming because I don't like it out there. It's weird. There's weirdos and all kinds of weird places and mm-hmm. things that bite and, and sting and eat. <laughs> Wyoming's a beautiful place. Just, and there's not very many people here. Where I went in Texas, um, it, it's like dead center of the state. It's a little place called Brownwood. Went to Howard Payne University. Um, some of the most down-to-earth people that I've ever met. Where's Brownwood? Is it south of Dallas? It's hour south of Abilene, two hours west of Dallas. Oh, okay. It so, is literally the center of that like state. Like dead center. like Which is saying a lot. I, I can't do the cheesy thing because I'm not Texan enough to use my hand and show you that it looks like <laughs> the state of Texas and point at the center. They did that all the time. I can't do that. Like, Texans and Michigan people. I'll do that. <laughs> I know, and I've got both of them. Well, at least at least Texas doesn't look like a mitten. You know? <laughs> That's true. So, i got to be careful. My wife's from Michigan. Yeah. <laughs> Originally. Originally. So did four years in Texas, and then I came back, and that um, that ne- not the first fall I was back, but the next fall, I actually killed my first elk. It took me that long. And then I didn't have a fall where I didn't kill an elk till here, at, wow. like a couple years ago. Like So I killed – and some, some falls it was multiple, fa- multiple elk. Then there were also falls where I – I would get, you know, Phil Not Cow Calf bulls, tag. obviously. Yeah, no. uh, where I – it was Raghorn Express, let's yeah. be perfectly honest. Where you're hunting in Region Meat. G. Yeah. It's called Freezer yeah. Full. And Region G is known for big deer. It's not known for the big bull elk. So right. if you see a five-point bull, you should probably think about yep. shooting. And they don't run the seasons when the big bulls are easy to find. It's, right. it's on purpose. Yep. And so changing, you know, changing gears about, about – time I moved here a little before I kind of got the mule deer bug and so I changed you know I changed that and then I drew some good elk tags up here and so that's how I kept that string string going even moving to a new place but 2019 was the last bull I shot or last elk I shot so so you went to college at at uh in at Howard Payne mm-hmm. what was the dream what 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 was what you know you you obviously left high school and went okay I'm gonna go down Howard Payne which is mm-hmm. which is a uh, Baptist school, yeah. correct? It's a private, yeah, private Christian school. Okay, and what was the dream then? So, was it to be sitting on a podcast teasing me? <laughs> <laughs> um, to be one hundred percent honest, i I wanted to do, I wanted to do ministry, but I looked at what the state of Wyoming was. My youth pastor, he. We were a church in Wyoming. It's 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 rare for a church to be able to have more than one staff person in the state of Wyoming. Yeah. So I you also still have knew the numbers. Well, no, we don't. It's, it's just not it, enough yeah. people. It, it, There's it, enough people to go to church, just not enough people. Mm-hmm. And, and and so I looked at it like, all right. So I want to do I want to do ministry, and the first two churches I found in Wyoming were actually able to have me as a full time staff person, but. I thought I wanted to do youth ministry forever, but I knew going to college that I was going to have to double major. So I got a do, I got one degree, which was in Christian studies with an emphasis in um, in practical theology. Then I got a second degree in um, communications with an emphasis in public relations, which also had underlying business courses and marketing and things that I took as well. So I knew that I was going to have to pro- if I wanted to have a family you're not going to be able to provide for it on a, on a small income on at a part-time at a church. You're going to have to have two, you're going to have to have two careers. Exactly. And I also double major two careers. Yeah. And I didn't want to be digging a ditch. Yeah. That, that for me, mm -hmm. like I'm capable of doing that. I I love construction. I love woodworking. It's up in Rock Springs and realize that January is not a lot of fun. (laughs) Oh, it's pretty miserable. (laughs) I I did that in college, actually. Like when I'd come home on breaks, I had a, I had a contractor that would hire me for two weeks where, you know, nobody's here, nothing going on. So he'd hire me just to frame. Yeah. And so, um, I, I, I don't want to do that. I would like to not be miserable and I'd like to have my knees when I'm 65. And so, I said, okay, I got to figure out a way. And I had always said, I was like, well, maybe I'll end up in a little place like Big Piney, you know, helping do youth ministry. And then, you know, you could always get an education certificate or right. or something of, of that nature to provide. And and so I, I thought that was that was kind of the dream. But then um, 
God, after college, moved me to Gillette, Wyoming, where I was a full-time youth pastor for three years. You dropped from the pot to the <clears throat> frying pan, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, it was pretty funny. It's another in, in Wyoming, it's another energy town. <laughs> well, you know why Rock Springs and Gillette hate each other? Because they're the same town. <laughs> yeah, the same town in opposite corners. Yes. And, and they, and, but they refuse to admit they hate each other. And so that's what makes a rivalry so much fun, though, too. You know, so I did three years there. I um, still have some really good friends that live there that I'll, I can catch up with. Um, and then as a youth yeah, pastor, uh, yep. I was a, I was a full-time youth pastor there. And then in rock Springs, So what was the other career? Well, you, I mean, you couldn't, I actually, I did six months of construction and, and youth, youth while I was okay. there. So you were doing two things. At yes, the same time. but it was tight there. Like yeah, that one that. was, um, really tight, but they wanted full time. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, that, but that opened my eyes. Like they want full-time hours, but they don't, they can't see that this one of the hard things in nonprofits that you look at is that people will look at the salaries of what people are making and they don't, they don't see that it doesn't work the same benefit wise. Or for instance, they'll look at a salary number and they have no idea that, Oh, my pastor says he's making, um, you know, 65,000. That looks like it's, it's respectable. Well, what they don't realize is that a chunk of that he never actually sees and it's called his housing allowance. Right. And so that's not actually cash that's going home. Right. Plus he's making 35 with a $30,000 housing allowance and they don't in retirement, they're, they're responsible for their own retirement. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yep. There's a, the health benefits that yep. go down the list. Yep. It isn't like if you were yep. working at the hospital getting benefits, a yep. benefits package on top of your 65000 Yep. And and it's not a big church in the South. And so that was a learning lesson for me in that, like, when I look at spreadsheets now, and tie, you know, ties a little bit back to what I, some of what I do here now. When I look at spreadsheets now, it opened my eyes to, that number's not always the whole picture. Right. right. There's there, there's more to what these numbers mean. There's more to the way they're talking. And so that taught me a lot. So the next place I went um, in Rock Springs, they had the idea that we got to pay this guy at least as well as we're paying our starting teachers. Yeah. You know, and that was a better, that was a much better situation from that perspective. That's also where I was introduced to Dave Ramsey and started, you know, started our journey in treating money like a, a tool and a resource yep. rather than something that's just, ex, 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 you know, just to pay bills, you know. So uh, <clears throat> you mentioned it, so I'm, uh, we'll talk about it here for a couple minutes. Dave Ramsey, mm-hmm. um, Ramsey Solutions, um, which my family's been involved mm-hmm. in, in that program since 2005. Mm-hmm. My wife and I have been on, on that program pretty religiously since 2005. We run our business that way. Mm-hmm. Um, he has a, he does a personal, you know, here's how you run your personal life the right way so that, mm-hmm. that you can actually retire at some point and, and, and you aren't stressed out about money every single day. Yep. And then he does a business. Here's how he runs his business, which is very, uh, very similar, but different because the business is yes. different. But it's all very biblical, mm-hmm. and um, we've been doing, we've been running our business that way since two thousand eight, mm-hmm. and uh, continue to, and it's it's been awesome. So you and your wife do Dave Ramsey now, yes, <laughs> and we've had several setbacks. So just anybody listening, it's normal. It's okay. Yep. Like I was trying to milk two more years out of this car we called Old Blue. Okay, <laughs> like Ike laughs because he's seen it. I treat. I made him park it on the street because it would just be an oil slick underneath it every day. <laughs> it was probably worse than that. There might be some antifreeze mixed in at the end. Um, head gasket went out. It finally went out. You know, so it was a '95 Oldsmobile that I drove. Like Dave Ramsey and you had would a bumper series says driving it for the environment. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. And, it's beyond recycling now. If anyone wanted to put a motor in that, I would question their sanity. Um, but so For Scott, I see the black cloud coming. He's coming in. Yes, and, and I was proud of that little thing. <laughs> Ike only rode in it once. I did. I would not ride in it again. Yes, and, and I wouldn't blame anyone for not riding in There's it again. There's a ninety percent chance we were walking. Yeah, <laughs> walking, and I treated the thing like crap. Like, like just to be brutally honest, I, I really did. Like, because I didn't care. It was like. It got the oil change. It got the maintenance, but the interior, I didn't care. It was one of those things. Like it was a tool for me to get from my house, which is two miles away to work and back occasionally to Cody. Yep. Um, so we thought we were going to be able to make it last a little longer. It didn't. We've had four kids, so we had to upgrade. And so 
our goal was to pay cash for the next vehicle. Well, it got added the snow uh, to the snowball, and we're 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 moving through it very quickly. So setbacks do happen, but you you can do it. You can get there. We're we're this close. The best so. thing I found with Dave Ramsey is you know there's there's three things that cause divorce, and one of them, the number one, almost every mm-hmm. single time is money. Mm-hmm. And the thing that I found unbelievable is once we started down that road, both got on the same page and rolling with it, um, those fights went away. Yep. And it turned into discussions. It went from fights to discussions to not even having a discussion. This is just our plan. Mm-hmm. And, we'll, you know, in every year, yep. uh, this is, we're, we're on the cusp of new year. And so yep. every year we go down through our plans of what we're going to do next year and, 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 that is amazing. Yep. So then you can fight about the other stuff, which is yep. kids, kids and religion <laughs> and in-laws. <laughs> well, plenty of that. We, well, case in point on how, how well it works, we just took a trip to – my wife's family is from uh, the Louisiana-Mississippi border area. So we just took a trip, but we had the cash saved to pay cash for yep. the flight. So we didn't use a credit card for that. Then we said, okay, we think this is how much we're going to need in savings for our Christmas expenses and for this trip. Yep. Let's give ourselves about 30% more than we think we're going to need because of Especially whatever. in this day and age when, yep. t- you know, tomorrow the flight could be double. Yes. And so we, we paid cash for that, put it in savings, and haven't missed a beat. Yep. So that – are versus what 10 years ago where we'd have been scraping to try and even pay half cash half in credit card like no that those days are over we're going to figure out how to do it the right way well and for those of you want to get on you're listening to a podcast dave ramsey has a podcast oh. podcast uh, if nothing else it's extremely entertaining because what he does he takes he takes phone calls mm-hmm. from from people that are struggling uh, financially um, and, and he walks them through on what they need to do and how they need to adjust their life. And, uh, it is extremely entertaining. Some of these people, mm-hmm. you just go, my God, how did you do that? How did yep. you get $300,000 in debt on credit cards? Yep. Or how did you take a $400,000 loan for schooling and you got a basket weaving degree? Yep. I mean, just things like yep. that. It, it's entertaining if nothing else. And and the best part like that it did for me, and this is going to sound so terrible when I say it, but I don't care. <laughs> it made me feel better about where I was at. Yeah. Like that yeah, that's helped. true. Like it, it, it emotionally Gave you a little perspective. me. Yes. We are not doing that bad. Okay. The numbers that I see coming in are actually stronger than what that guy with the smaller shovel was able to tackle. Right. Because there's the other end of that perspective where you hear of two teachers where they're like, yeah, we're barely scraping by, you know, in Tennessee, but we, we figured out how to pay all this off, took side hustles in the summer. And, yep. and so that part has helped us tremendously get there. And so... You know, here's another crazy part is we pressed pause on the snowball because baby number four was a surprise. We'll call it a COVID baby. I <laughs> act like it's not a surprise, but whatever. <laughs> it's not and, a surprise. It hap- Your kids' birthdays are all like within a month of each other, aren't they? It's because you keep bringing me to shows and we like to have fun afterwards. <laughs> four kids. You have four. So just so the audience knows, he has four children mm-hmm. under six, right? Uh, seven. Seven. Okay. Under seven. Yep. But you had four kids under six. Not long ago, yes. <laughs> like in December. Yeah. Well, beginning of the month. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of children. That is a lot of diapers. That's a lot of screaming. That's a lot of... Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Anyway, it's a lot of chaos. We're almost done, though. This was crazy. With, with having with, kids? With, or with diapers. With, oh, oh, oh. Like, Everett is 18 months... And then we're both kind of in the borderline teary-eyed phase because of how big he's getting in our arms. And you it's see him transition. sitting there, and you're like, I'm not sure. How, he's not little. Yeah. You know? And But it's the dawning realization that there is not the possibility for – yes, it's gone. The possibility is gone. That's been taken care of. Um, <laughs> we can permanently close the goalie. <laughs> yeah. My, my say, I heard a long time ago, and I adopted this because I'm a hockey player, is that – my goalie stunk. You know, the goal the goalie wasn't playing too good that night. <laughs> well, you just took the hot, you just took the puck off the field. That's what you did. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Oh, well, that'd be a weird game. Um, so, <laughs> okay. So you have four. You have four. Yes. Let's get back on track. Gosh, Sorry. this turned into a Dave Ramsey podcast with children involved. 
So <laughs> you you have four kids. Mm-hmm. Um, you started hunting when you were a kid. Um, your oldest two are girls. Yes. Ha- have they hunted? They have. Um, Ella has gone with me. She's actually in one of the wingman videos. Um, she is she going with us tomorrow? I don't know if she's going to be. She got an earache this morning. Oh, so okay. I think Joy's going to be, but I'm I'm not telling her until she goes to bed not sick. <laughs> Wakes up not sick. Yes. Yeah. So we're. Um, I would like to bring Joy with me tomorrow. She is going. She is my jabber box, so she will talk our ears off. Well, her and Tibber would set them there and let them talk. Yep, and she'll raise her hand and say, "I have something to say," <laughs> she, and she will do that. I promise you, tomorrow it'll be interesting. Um, but they all have gone on hunts with me now. I have. I very intentionally handpicked the hunts that I bring my kids on because I do not want their their experiences hunting to be miserable. Yep. And so Joy came along with my dad and I on a duck hunt where it was a pretty warm day, but we brought an extra blanket along. Her and dad sat back in the willows. She's cuddled up next to him. Ace is cuddled up next to them, and I'm over in another bush. We didn't kill a thing that day. Every time a duck comes, who it's coming, you know. <laughs> and so this is a year in ago. her pink coat. In her pink coat. <laughs> and so we had we had a lot of fun with it. It was it was a good day. She got to see Ace, you know, attempt to go look, and Kate like shot at some that you know. I wanted to make sure they didn't, they were down or whatever. And so what made him work and she, she enjoyed seeing him do that, which was fun. Um, so I bring the kids along. The one that's been a lot of fun is Ian is my three-year-old boy. And he thinks that every hunt that you and I go on is a, is a hunt with llamas and it is an adventure. (laughs) And so YouTube too much. Yes. He watches it all the time. So for Christmas, his grandparents, my parents, um, bought him this wonderful elk call. And so now he walks up and down the hall. Ee, ee. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're wonderful. Could you have done that any worse? Uh, there will be a discussion. I just haven't had it yet. Or You can't yeah. even take the batteries out of that. That's what happens at our house. I don't know. Yeah. Batteries just don't work. <laughs> yes, exactly. Batteries, it just died. So, Can we change the batteries? I don't see where the batteries are. Yeah, this is this is my life. But they are free babysitting literally every day of the week when Rachel goes to work. That's so true. Um, I guess I can tolerate some milk calls. Or it just ends up back at their house. Maybe just teach him how to use it. <laughs> yep. So he, uh, he went on – he is obsessed with looking at pictures of all my deer and the deer that I scout. Like he asked me to look every day. Dad, can I look at my doe? Because I shot a doe on October 15th with a type 6 tag that I have here. But I brought him with me, and he got to sit in the front seat, watch the whole thing play out, and it was perfect. And then he asked when I went to go get the Yukon and bring it around to, to put the deer in. He's like, can I stay with the deer, Dad? I'm like, yeah, you can stay with the deer. And so he stayed, and so I've got pictures of him squatting down next to the doe. It's, <laughs> it's, it's pretty fun to get to do that. Well, and if you start them early, I, I always tell people, start those kids early where they don't have time to have the outside world influence Mm -hmm. them that there's something wrong with this. And then when people tell them there's something wrong with it, they look at them and go, you're crazy. I've been doing this since I can remember. Um, I, you know, I've done this very similar with my kids and I took my 12 year olds finally old enough to uh, hunt this year. She killed her first doe. Uh, we, we hunted really hard actually for a buck (laughs) that she's tough. It was cold, uh, 10 days straight. She counted them 10 days straight and she just couldn't get, uh, we just couldn't get a buck. We found does during buck season. And then during doe season, we found bucks. It was what, you know, mm-hmm. just the, anyway, ended up killing a doe. And, uh, she's 12 year old girl. And on her, the front of her cell phone, you know, the, the screensaver yep. and the, the page behind all the apps is that photo of her with her doe. And I thought, wow, she's just doing this because of, you know, for me or whatever. And, I was around a bunch of her friends recently and they all kind of had, I wouldn't say a competition, but they all got a little bit of ego yep. about who was killing what and all that stuff. And they all had their cell phones out. So I just walked behind them. Every single one of those girls, the six girls out of the six girls, five of them killed an animal this year. They're <laughs> all 12. Every single one of them, their screensaver and their, and their desktop is them with their animal. Yep. That's a game changer. Yep. I know we live in a, in a really small rural state and that's a, you know, that's not, you wouldn't think that's a huge thing, but that's mm-hmm. a huge thing because yep. now you have, they have perspective and yep. going forward, just like Ian has perspective, three years old, mm-hmm. he's not going to remember not hunting. Yep. Exactly. You're just not. I mean, how much things do you remember from th- being three? I don't remember being three. Mm-hmm. I remember a couple big deals at three and that was it. Yep. So 
that's that's really cool that you're doing that. So, what was your first animal? <laughs> My first animal. Um, Back to hunting with your dad, who mm-hmm. <laughs> who the neighbors believe... said you're not doing this right. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's hundred percent true. Um, so the one. I didn't pull the trigger on it, but my dad, um, he shot a doe with me there. So that one was quote unquote, the first one I was around. So I was elementary school. Mm -hmm. It was last day of the hunt. He was kind of tired of hunting. So was our, the guy who was his hunting partner. And so that one was, that one was cool, but here's, here's a funny one for you. So obviously dad started later. So he, he couldn't take me out when I was three, but I think this one was fourth grade. I went hunting with him the first time when I was in third grade. But fourth grade is where he killed something where I was there. And so he kills this doe. And I had, that was the year that Jurassic Park came out. And I was worried about the gutting. Oh, boy. Like, because I was like, I've never been exposed to that. And how honestly, old were you? probably 10. Okay. You know, so I was like, so, but Jurassic Park came out that year and I had seen it. And I told dad, I was like, I saw Jurassic Park. I can handle the gutting. <laughs> and little did I know there's a smell. You know, so that one was, that one was interesting. Um, to learn if you have a gag reflex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then the first one I actually shot, I shot a doe too. Um, and we get it to the check station and the warden says, man, you did this one a favor. She was old. <laughs> she would have died this year. And I'm like, thanks for that. You know? <laughs> and so anyway, he's, he's kind of chuckling to himself. So that was, a, that was an interesting story. The next one was my first buck was a little four corn that I, that I shot. Um, but that one was, that one was an education because like I was breathing so heavy. I was nervous right. first buck and the day before I had missed a big deer. Oh, like that. So, so do off. I, yeah. Do I want to shoot it? Do I not want to shoot it? And dad tell me, Scott, this is our last morning. You know, if you want to shoot it, you can. Yeah. So I also realized my dad's kill count was directly relative to how many times he wanted me to shoot as well. Uh, so there, there's, there's an element to that too. Cause he was very self-sacrificial where he could have killed things and didn't. Yeah. Um, so what dads do it. It's true. I, I fully expect to experience that and probably not going to care. Um, so as I'm squeezing, I'm watching as this buck, as I'm squeezing, you know, from a point of no return, I watch it turn to go downhill. So I hit it back here all the way through the guts and it comes up here and I ended up having to finish it with a knife. It was messy, you know, smells. Not a all. great experience. No, that one wasn't a great experience. And like dad went back because we were walking a four wheeler trail. We had parked and, and left it there so we could just walk because we always saw deer crossing. And so he came, came back. He's like, I didn't expect you to start gutting it. You did this by yourself. This is a mess. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, yeah, it is. This is pretty miserable. So a lot of gagging and things like that. But we got it clean, got it home. Um, a lot of burger was made out of that one, <laughs> just to be 100% transparent. But that's my first buck. So best animal. What's the best one you've taken? <sighs> okay. So I don't define best by the score. You and I have had this discussion. Um, for me, score is a score is a way for me and you to talk about an animal on the hill. Like it's, it's, it's like, talk about maturity. Yes. And, and so like, and then, then I move down. I want to kill the oldest, most impressive buck that I can find on the mountain. Um, I want to break 200. Don't, don't hear me wrong when I say that I have not done that yet. The best one I shot was my 185 um, score wise um, from 2021. Um, I'm pretty proud of that animal. There's a lot more to that story that I don't think I'm going to tell. Yeah. Yeah. They so. watch the episode. It's yeah. on YouTube. Uh, no, that was 2020. Oh, 20. Oh, oh, yep. oh, 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 okay. Yeah. I the year's wrong. Yep. All right. So 20, yeah, 2021 is a bit of yep. a mess. And, yep. And, uh, We'll yeah, leave it at we'll that. We'll leave, leave it at that <laughs> um, for a variety of reasons. I haven't figured out a way to properly tell that story, and I don't know that I will for another 10 years, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, and so then 2020 was 2020 was a lot of fun. I found a, I did, I found a legit 200-incher that I actually never saw in season. I found him at the opener of archery, um, but I was just scouting. I was, putting, I, was, I was making sure he was in the same places. And so I didn't want to disturb him for rifle. Never found him during rifle. I've killed a good three by three, but I think I've finally settled on it. I haven't got to tell you this yet. 
but I finally settled on it. I decided the buck, because I've, I've never, this is crazy. I've got a whole bunch of euros of, of nice bucks on my wall, but I don't have one shoulder mounted. Part of it is that was extra, like right. Ramsey world. Right. So, but not quite in the, uh, the budget. Yes, exactly. And, and it hasn't come across as an, as Christmas presents turn into needs for Taxidermy us. Taxidermy is not part of the baby steps. No, it's not. I don't think uh, Dave Ramsey would call that a necessity. <laughs> and so I finally decided which one I'm going to get done now that we're pretty close to there. And I'm going to get that 2018 buck one, the one that you and yep. I killed together. Yep. And the reason, mm-hmm. and the reason for that is that of all the bucks that I've taken, the story of that one is is the greatest. So let's talk about that for a second. People, I, I was I was recently just asked this. Um, had a holiday party at my house, and of course, you know, I don't, I don't have a ton of stuff. Yeah, I don't, I'm not one of those guys that has a trophy room full of stuff. Yep. But I have, you know, I have a life size mounted Rocky Mountain goat. I got a ibex. I got an elk, and yep. antelope, and a deer. And I was asked by uh, a gal that is my wife's friends. She said, I don't, she goes, I don't understand. She goes, I don't mind hunting. We eat it. His, her husband hunts, but she says, I don't understand why you mount it. Mm. She goes, walk me through that. I'm not against it, but walk me through why you mount it. Why do you mount it? Why do you want to mount that? For me, it's, for me, it's about a, a tribute to the animal. Now let's, let's call a spade a spade. Taxidermy is kind of weird. Like it, it is. <laughs> yeah. so go, this is a Jeffrey Dahmer type crap. What 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 is that? I killed it to resurrect it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, this is kind of kind of weird like, stuff. Kind of like having Fifi over there in the corner <laughs> stuffed for permanent. You know, that's a little odd. Yeah, and and so the reason I want to do it is there's a big memory attached to it, and for me that that 2018 buck it in, it encompasses several things that like our real highlights of the, the 10 years here at Eastman's number one, you know, I've got this bucket list where I want to hunt with everybody in this office once like a, a successful hunt. Well, for me, I don't know that you and I can top that hunt. That was, it was, you couldn't have choreographed that any better. Yeah. It was a hell of an adventure. There was a lot of adversity from beginning to mm-hmm. end. It was, it was, it was really yep. in, in how that played out with the deer doing things that they shouldn't have done. And we were in the right place at the <laughs> right time. It's just crazy. Yep. It was crazy. So I can't top it. Like that's yeah. number one. I can't top that. Um, the number two is that the buck's just impressive. Like I, I set him next to my buck. That's 185. Like, and I asked a question, like I posted on social media. I was like, which buck would you shoot? And I, and, and without a doubt, the 2018 buck, everybody said they would shoot, even though he's a three by four, his fronts are just ridiculous. Yeah. So on a wall, it's an impressive memory on an impressive animal. I'm going to be able to, his cape was beautiful. Yep. So we're going to, I'm going to be able to tie all those things to together. And that's why I'm going to do the shoulder mount. It's about the memory that's on the wall with it. That's what I told, I told this guy, I said, it's, it's a, you know, we get trophies. What is one of the best prize trophies in our society? A gold medal, mm-hmm. Olympic gold medal. Why? It's a medal. It's just yep. a chunk of gold. Well, it signifies an accomplishment. Yep. And an in a, in a amount to me signifies accomplishment. Plus every single time I look at that, whatever it is, if it's my Mongolian Ibex, which was an oh. unbelievable adventure that I had with my dad. Mm-hmm. Um, I instantly, I can, I look at that Ibex and I can smell the smells. I can feel the heat oh. coming off of the slate rocks at 95 degrees. I can remember my dad saying, you're going to have to do this on your own. Cause I can't get there. All those things, yep. all those things instantly come back by when I look at that yep. 3d version mm-hmm. of a trophy. And, and, uh, you know, I have a, I have the photo of, of the actual, uh, mm-hmm. the grip and grin trophy photo next to it. It's just, it's one of those things that. Um, no one else will have that yep. experience. That's why when you buy mounts, you know, there's somebody else's mounts, they're not worth a whole lot, yep. but they're worth a ton to get done Yep. because it's all about experience. And memory. yeah, nobody will ever understand the personal nostalgia that's there. And so that buck is going to go in my office here yeah. when I get it done. Like it's, it, it's multiple. We have enough people from the industry that stop in to see that buck from the film and that yeah. sort of thing would be cool. And then, like 
tying it to Mike's old films that had the llamas in and the way we did that. Yep. I, I back can't to the, top back that. to Mike's book. Yep. Back to dad's book. Exactly. Hunting trophy, which is a huge chunk about hunting with livestock and llamas as well. <laughs> yep. And so <laughs> that's cool. I, that's what, that's why I decided that. So that's how that's going to play out. So to me, that 185 is my best, biggest buck. He's up on my wall now, Euro mounted. Actually, there's a buck in 2013. Oddly enough, I thought he would ne- wouldn't actually score well, but he's got a ton of stuff on his bases, wow. and so he's actually pretty comparable to my right. my buck from 2020. I, I sent you that picture yeah. actually, and so he's a low 180s, and then the, there's the 185. Um, I still want to kill a 200 in the high country. We'll see if my body will let me. That's yeah. going to be the We're next starting phase. To get to that, that age that even with llamas, that becomes uh, mm-hmm. a harder and harder. Yep. His knees aren't working like they used to and shoulders and Everything. ankles and yeah. Yeah. So what do you what is Scott Reekers? You've you know, obviously you hunt for, mm-hmm. for Eastman's mm-hmm. a little bit. Um, what do you do here on a day to day? On a day to day basis, um, when people ask me that, I tell them that I have th- three main responsibilities. Podcasts are where what are getting a lot of emphasis right now because of the growth that we're doing there. Um, there's business development, which I'll explain what that is in a little bit. And then social media falls under my wing, but there's a guy sitting over here who actually, he, he, <laughs> he does most of it. Yes. Soon will be so, the social media director. Yeah. When I, when I say most, we're talking 95%. Eight months ago, we said 90%, you know, <laughs> there's less and less I do, which is my goal. Um, but that ties back to my mission statement. I, I train people to replace myself. Yeah. Like that, which learning to do that requires a lot of letting go of your ego. Um, you can, we could go and through learning a list. how to delegate mm-hmm. and then also learning how to let people fail. Yeah. Like, and, and then not judging them against yourself yeah. because your pace and the way that you would do things worked for you, but they may be able to outpace that over time with their growth space and their bandwidth, which is hard. Yeah. That's a, it, it you have to suck your ego and know when there's coaching necessary and when there isn't coaching necessary and how to make sure you say it well. Um, business development in the Eastman's world, what that actually means is Ike comes to me with his hopes, dreams, and prayers and says, <laughs> mostly prayers. <laughs> yes. It says, start it, build a plan, figure out how it's going to make money. Oh, by the way, you have six months to do it. And I'm like, what in the world? And I, um, okay, let's be realistic. No, uh, that's, that's not true. What actually happens is Scott <clears throat> comes to me and says, Hey, have you ever heard of what a podcast is? A what? Yep. Is it? No. Is, is this a fishing thing? <laughs> <laughs> he goes, so, oh, Brian Barney, one of our writers, has this podcast, and mm-hmm. that's where it all started. Yep. And so business development literally means that, you know, tag Eastman's Tag Hub is, has, is and has been my baby. It actually probably started with our first few versions of the digital magazine, like yeah. where, where that – and that was pre – before I was here. Kind of took a hiatus because we needed technology to catch up and things like that. And now we're in phase where we're getting pretty close to launching Tag Hub 2.0. Yeah. And so that's going to be really that exciting. That 2.0 is crazy. I've seen, I've seen uh, pieces of it. It's, it is, it's really, instead of 2.0, I think we jumped to like 4.7. Yes. I mean, it's, it's that, that yeah. much crazier. Uh, with the ability, that, the stuff that you can do with maps and, mm-hmm. and overlays and yep. heat maps and uh, predictions and oh my gosh. Yes. And and so we're, I, I'm having weekly development meetings on that. Sometimes like twice a week I'm having meetings yeah. on that and it's going very well. Um, I don't want to predict a timeline because it's technology, and every time I do that, I end up eating eating my words. <laughs> so I just don't predict that anymore. I say soon. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so that's what what business development is. Also, is I'll take an advertising relationship where we're trying to figure out what does this look like, yeah. and so I I get some of the weird clients is the way Brandon puts it. They're out of the box. Yes. They're n- non endemics, <laughs> you know, black rifle coffee yep. is a perfect example of that. That was started, you know, that relationship was started yep. with you and is, and it has fostered into an unbelievable relationship, but I would have never thought of going down that road because yep. they're non endemic I mean, black rifle. Do they fit in the hunting space? A hundred percent. Absolutely. But it's not, you know, savage rifles. Yeah. It's not 
cryptic clothing. Yep. It's something that is ancillary or something that is that is non endemic. Yep. You know, so yeah, and, and you so do really well with that. You really do, and it's and, fun to watch a relationship like that or with Fieldcraft. You know, Mike <laughs> Glover and those guys. You know, working them in. Hey, how do we work together? I like what you're doing. You like what we're doing. How do we work together? Yep. Because there are some of those um, relationships where we're like, this isn't hundred percent just a, a straight. You know, work together as advertising partnerships, things like that. Like we do things at Fieldcraft's headquarters because it makes sense for us both to draw people there. There's a bunch of subjects that they they don't cover well that we do. Yeah. And so I'm able to work with them and we host a clinic there yeah. on, on hunting seminar and that sort of thing. So I'll do behind the scenes things, work with their team to develop that. Um, but business development is weird because it's like you're going to fail a lot more than you're going to succeed. And that, again, check your ego at the door because if if you want to develop a business, it's going to take a lot of work. And then then again, you also have to understand where your limitations are. So again, I'll use social media. I ran our social media for you know, seven years and then handed it off to Luke and, you know, incrementally. And he's doing far better things with it because he's got a creative mind that is better than mine as far as taking something, an idea and concept and putting it on the screen. I'll hand him something and be like, hey, these are the assets for a post. And it turns out completely different than I would have ever done, but 100,000 times better. I, I, I don't think I've ever said this to his face, but I call him the king of cool. Mm -hmm. He always knows what's cool. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it's my age and, it, you know, he's half my age, yep. which probably helps. But yep. he always knows the stuff that's cool. So yep. it's, it's 100%. So one of the other things that I want to talk about is bus in business development is acquisitions. Mm -hmm. We have an acquisition coming yep. along um, that we're uh, merging with another company, partnering with another company, mm -hmm. really on something that we've never done. Yep. Um, and that's going to be fun. So watch for, watch for that. Yep. Um, I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag because the ink's not dry yet, yep. but uh, it's going to be really fun with somebody that we've worked with for a very long time Yep. and uh, very close. So that'll be cool. Um, you, and you've, you've been very instrumental <laughs> on that. Um, the other thing in, in, to your point of business development of checking your ego at the door do you remember the river runs through it when yep. they're doing the writing and they mm -hmm. give it to their dad and he goes, you know, looks, reads it yep. and goes, that's fine. Now cut it in half. Yep. Now cut it in half. Now cut it in half. That's kind of what I, what we've been doing with these business developments. Yep. Okay. Here's our dream. Okay. Now cut it in half. Yep. Okay. Here's what we think. Nope. Cut it in half again. Yep. Cut it in half again. And that's that you get you, you know, you get closer to what your reality is really going to yeah. look like. It helps you redefine your priorities. Yes. What is the most what is the most important thing that I know that guys I'm going to use tag up as an example for this since it's my my closest uh, to next coming out um, with an update is that what were the most important things that we wanted to see our subscribers have that we were hearing that they were telling us well if you had this I'd definitely buy it right and so that is what we prioritize with this next version that is coming out. We said, okay, these are the things that are most important. And then just because if they're telling me it's the most important, it is the most important. It's not what I say is the most important or what I think is because one of the ego traps that you can get into is, in business is these shiny trinkets. Yeah. Like this shiny trink, but it's my shiny trinket. Yeah. But nobody sacred cares cows. about your your. Dave Ramsey yeah. calls them sacred cows. Mm -hmm. Kill them all. Yep. Kill them all and eat them. Yep. Back feed them to the villagers. Yep. And so we've already started planning with this development team that I've got. Okay, this is what's coming in twenty four. This is what's going to come in twenty five. But we have to do this incrementally. We can't do it all at once just to get launched. Right. So. So what does the future look like? <laughs> so. I've got some very big plans. Um, I'll break this up into the, the groups. Um, you know, you, you use the term right-hand man, so I'll use this. You guys have heard me mention Luke quite a bit. Um, Luke is my right-hand man. The projects I work on don't succeed unless he and I are working together like lockstep where we're planning things together, where we're brainstorming together, um, where I am ensuring that he is succeeding because – he is the distribution channel for all of the things that we're doing, especially anything that is a digital platform. You can't sell something in the digital space without making people aware of it on your social media or your email channels. Right. 
absolutely have to happen. So that is that is my relationship with him. So we're going to continue to expand our social. But one of the things that we're really doing is growth in our podcast group. And so what I want, my my vision, my dream, my direction without giving the farm away is I want to own one of the biggest spaces in not just like Western hunting podcasts, but like the outdoor space for podcasts. I want to own one of the biggest groups. And I don't, it's not out of ego that I want to do that. It's that I look across our brand, who we are, who we interact with, and our ability to build things. And I think we can serve people well with that. We can give them the tools to go out and adventure. We can help them in any type of adventure across the world. And I want to be able to help them do that. And then I want to see them be able to personally grow through that because those stories coming back fuel the flames on more and more and more. Tie it back to the journals. We have success yeah, stories. Started helping people become better hunters yes. through an entertainment, entertaining media. Yes. And so that's that's the podcast world. Um, we've, we've been over Tag Hub 2.0. And so that is going to be huge. There are going to be even more big things that are there. I want to see us even work even more on our content side there, like our distribution and content that will be inside of Tag Hub. Um, I want to see that expand. I've got some plans for trying to help our subscribers um, get even better deals on gear. I would like to really see if we can make that work. Um, I, I'm still penciling and working and finding the right partners to do that. We've already got gear, gear discounts, but I think we can expand that and do a little bit more and better. So that's something I'm really hoping um, for. I'm also looking um, at any and every strategic partnership that I can to continue to grow those spaces. Um, and so I've got some I've got some pretty cool partners that are there. Um, one of my jobs right now is for this podcast, I am I've been tasked with finding big fish. Big fish that makes sense for this podcast. Yeah, we got some we got some big fish sign up. I mean Rich Froning. Yeah, Rich Froning. Rich Froning. Got, uh, Bruins. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, Kevin Millar and Brad Marchant. Um, they're both going to be be on this podcast in the very near future. Um haven't talked to him yet. I do have his contact, though. Brent Burns might be another hockey player that we couldn't talk to. Um, who are some other names that? Well, it's just yeah. We're we're what the the point of this is the red thread is hunt, yep. <clears throat> is hunting, mm -hmm. and we want to talk about we'll talk to guys on why they hunt. So why do you hunt? Yep. Why do I hunt? Yes. <sighs> so it's so deep. Um, <laughs> I hunt. Okay, so there's there's multiple levels of why I hunt. There's the okay, there's a standard answer. Every one of us hunts for meat. Okay, let's yeah. let's not act like that's special. No, but that that's not special. It's, Even it's if you're going to the grocery store, you're still hunting for meat. Well, and, I, and I'm pretty good at that. That brisket <laughs> looks good, man. Um, <laughs> so, but point of of hunting, the point of hunting to me is that there's a conservation element um, where I understand that management of the species is incredibly important. We as hunters are the hands, feet, and eyes of these game agencies. And they know it. They, you know, like they may have degrees in biologies and things like that, but when we when we validate what they see in studies or when we say your study's wrong, you need to check this because that is and, and they see this across all their surveys, that gives them something that they need to look at. Yeah. So we are conservationists in partnership with our agencies. If you don't fill out your surveys, if you don't send in, in comments about the way they're managing, um, managing big game or managing areas, you are not doing your job as a hunter. So you hunt as a conservation mm -hmm. beast. Yes. Meat procurement. Mm -hmm. And then I want big deer like this. <laughs> As we all do. As I mean, we all, we all want to break that 200 mark, right? Yes. Well, you, you did a few I years did. ago. I did. And so I've actually done it twice. I only know about the once. I know. <laughs> so, um, one of the, the but one of the last questions, and and I'm going to talk a little bit about mentorship. And one of the last questions mm -hmm. I want you to be thinking about is, on your deathbed, mm -hmm. what are you thinking about? You know what what. What are the things that matter to Scott Reekers 
<laughs> as you're laying on your deathbed thinking of your life and thinking of the future. I think one of the cool things that I've got out of this podcast is that you're really about mentorship, mm-hmm. constantly about mentoring people mm-hmm. in, you know, in, a, in their walk with God, in their spiritual mm-hmm. life, mentoring people inside of our organization, mentoring, you know, relationships, <laughs> mentoring stuff. Um, so when you lay on your deathbed, what not only is mentoring going to be part of it, but what, what are, what are you thinking of? 200 inch deer? What are we, what are we no. of? At the end of my life, like I want, uh, let's break this into, se- into segments. Cause I'm a male and men are like waffles. Women are like spaghetti. So that's gotta be a book. It is a book. Um, <laughs> it, it was a Christian answer to men are from Mars. Women are from Venus ah. kind of thing. And so the men compartmentalize everything. So we all have our boxes. So that's why, that's why we're terrible about talking at work at home. Yeah. Like we, we come home and I'm home. This is, this is my talk with this kids. Is not, this is not work. So, compartment. yeah, this is not work. This is not the work waffle box. And so when I'm going to start with, with family, number one, I have not done my job. If my kids do not have a healthy relationship with God. Now they'll all work at their own pace yeah. and they're all going to be different, but One of the ways that I made sure that my kids were going to have that relationship is they get prayed with with, by me every single night. They also have the Bible read to them on a regular basis by me. Um, Then it is not their mother's job to make sure they end up in Sunday school. It is my job to make sure that they end up at church. They need to understand the importance of those things in their life. And then on top of that, we do... We still do ministry. I didn't leave ministry. This is this is a funny story. Um, we knew our time in Rock Springs was like, okay, Lord, you're shutting doors. What are you telling us? That sort of thing. And I knew I wanted to do college ministry because our college ministry was thriving there, but youth was like, it's kind of a struggle right now. We didn't yeah. realize what was going on. And so um, I'll get this back to deathbed, I promise. Um, <laughs> so it was really funny, like, Rachel's looking and we had, I'd come up here to preach at a youth event and actually in Grable, Wyoming. And I talked about BCM with, um, with a guy that was here. We thought, eh, we'll look into it. Um, but he was the pastor actually at a church in Grable at the time. And we started praying about it. We weren't sure about it. And then finally, like, we said, okay, we're going to commit to it. And I said, well, Rachel, let's look into what it looks like to move after May, finish out the school year here. That gives me some time to train people, to make sure they're doing the things that need to happen, things for camp. Then we've got all summer to get ready for college ministry. And I thought I was going to be working at like a sporting goods store and Cody trying to make ends meet and do college ministry and things like that. I had no idea. Well, Rachel's looking in the Powell paper to see what does a para at a school even make. And she's looking to see if there are any openings, you know, because she's thinking I got to apply in May. And she sees this job at Eastman's for a social media coordinator. And she looks at the requirements. She's like, Scott, you got a degree for that. You've been freelancing for, for fun, for you know, doing gear reviews and things like that. So you learned how to use WordPress. You should send in your resume. So on your death on your deathbed, you're thinking about easements? No, I'm come not. on, Scott. Dude, I know you're killing I'm, me. Here. I know, and I'm I'm going a long way a long ways around um, to to say so. We, I put my resume together. By the next morning at six forty five, you had already emailed me and said, "Hey, let's talk today." Yeah. And so one of the things on my deathbed that I want my kids to see is sometimes you got to step out in faith. Like I want them to understand that I was obedient enough to do, to put my resume there, you know, and Rachel and I talked about it. We knew that this was, this is a little different than moving in May because I ended up moving in February. It was, it was fast, but I want them to understand that sometimes there's stepping out in faith that you're going to do that. Rachel and I didn't realize we were both burned out and we needed that six months before the fall started figure out ministry again, figure out life, buy a house, get established, do all these things that we needed to do in order to get set up. And now I want my kids to see that because we stepped out in faith. Well, one of the areas of ministry, Rachel and I both really believe in is international missions. And so we've talked about my trip to Africa. That was instrumental in, in both our lives. I've been to Mexico five times on mission trips. Um, multiple places across the States, been to Canada. Well, there's a very strong international program at our college here. 
I want my kids to understand how important missions is to us so that they see that that's why we're why we're spending time with these international students. My kids have more exposure to more nationalities than than just about anyone anyone else's kids, hands down, guaranteed. Yeah. So and, you, you have all these international kids mm-hmm. coming for dinner coming, on Monday nights. Co- yep, coming for dinner and they spend time with us. Um, we adopt several of them, quote unquote adopt. It's not actually adoption. They don't like us to use that term, but that's what we do. Um, <laughs> or the way we look at it for a year, you're hours and you're going to spend time with us. And so... We take care of them, make sure they're fed. If they have any needs, um, funny story, this is the first time I've ever said this publicly, um, but our ministry was able to support a young lady from Russia. Um, all of her finances got cut off while she was here when the when the war with Ukraine started. Ooh, she, she, something she, I never thought about. Well, she's, she's sitting here like, well, this is great. I'm here in America, and my, you know, my income that was in my account that's tied back to Russia, I can't do anything with. And so we were able to anonymously give her um, b- about 50 bucks a week just to, it was enough to make sure that she could still go out and enjoy being here with friends. All her meals were taken care of, but I didn't want her last, last uh, semester here to be tainted by the fact that something completely outside of her control, you know, right. affected right. Her, her view. And so as a result, this young lady, she pieced it together who it was. Like we did it anonymously on purpose. We didn't want her to feel like she owed right. us, but she pieced it together who it was who had done that. But now my kids will know about that. Right. Those are the type of things that on my deathbed, I want them to remember that we did that have an impact on them. But then I also want my other college students that are thinking about ministry I want them to have that type of relationship. Now tie that back here. You and I've had this conversation in relation to how do we do pay structures and things like that. And part of this is from Ramsey is be generous. When I'm making a decision about, okay, how do we structure commissions and how do I build this budget and make this work, you know, and make sure there's still a profit for the company, but also we're taking care of our people. Because that's a little bit more stressful when you're seeing that side of the equation where you know, yep. somebody, somebody could be trying to decide whether they're going to get a mortgage based on what you're going to be able to sell. Right. Okay. That's a little bit, you know, yep. that's a little stressful. And so, but it's be generous. Like I want people to, oh man, he was such a tight wad. I don't, I don't want that on my deathbed. I want them to think back and say, okay, he helped take care of us. He was generous. He was giving. And then I want that to reflect all the way back to like, tie this back to where my, my parents, that attitude was given. And what I learned around our table where they figured out early that, you know what, we need to bring these people over that don't have a place. So, so it's, it's mentoring and it's giving back and, and, and it's life, not trophies, not instances, not specific things. It's, it's what you've given to other people to, it's a legacy. Yep. It's what you're giving your kids. It's what you're Mm -hmm. giving your college kids that they'll remember and pass it on. Yep. Back to it's a mentorship. Yep. Well, I appreciate you coming in and uh, letting me sit down, find out who Scott is, (laughs) share share this with the world. I'm thinking 10 uh, years it took you that long. (laughs) (laughs) Well, actually, I did. I learned about five things on this that I didn't know. You you and I travel a lot. Yeah, we do. And nothing better to do than sitting on an airplane talk about Mm -hmm. stuff. So I appreciate it. Folks, remember um, Tag Hub, which is Scott's deal. There's yep. all, always deals on Eastman's.com. Log on to, to Eastman's and, and get whatever special offer, if it's a vinyl harness or a piece of clothing or a knife or whatever. Uh, Tag Hub's an awesome resource to help you become a better hunter and take that trophy of a lifetime. Till next time, I'm Mike Eastman. You're, you're listening to Eastman's podcast.